Hello class. This is going to be the lecture about argumentation. Argumentation is sort of like writing paragraphs, but actually having purpose for those paragraphs. I know students have expressed to me their concern about how do I write well or what makes good writing. And that answer really ties to argumentation. If you know how to construct arguments well, then your writing in turn will be more effective. To start though, before we dive into arguments, I want to ask the question of the day or the question of the week, and that, that is, is a hot dog a sandwich? So what I want you to do for this question of the day uh, is tell me if you think a hot dog is a sandwich or not, and then tell me why. And this will be the first question of the participation quiz this week. So just take a moment, you can pull that quiz up. Uh, you're always welcome to take them at the same time as these videos, to close and come back to them. You can open it up and start that answer right now. Now that you've written that uh, answer, let's move on to the notes. As I mentioned earlier, that a paragraph is a lot like an argument. Except when students talk about body paragraphs, sometimes they're fixated on the like really micro level construction of it needs a topic sentence, three more sentences, a concluding sentence, it has to be this long, this many words, and that that's too much to think about, and it's not the pieces that make the paragraph effective. What makes a paragraph effective is if you follow argumentation structure. I mentioned this earlier, uh, before spring break, that there are three parts to an argument. Claim, support, and rationale. The claim is a statement that's a debatable idea. Support is the material that substantiates the claim. This is what we discussed before break. It was things like secondary sources, the data evidence you can get, or illustrations or analogies that you can provide the reader. Those would be supports. And after that, there's a rationale, which is the explanation, the premise, or the reasoning about how the support proves the claim, or how the support connects to the claim. So these might be familiar, might not, but these three parts make an argument effective. To talk about that a little bit more, um, the first thing is there's like a golden ratio with this, and that tends to be a one to one to one ratio, one claim to one support to one rationale. The reason is because when you have, for example, a lot of support, which is something very common with student writing, students might feel like I just hit my like the reader with so much support they can't argue against me. But the reality is it can overwhelm the reader and it confuses the reader to see so much support for one claim. It's sort of like a, a court case. If like I'm wasting my jury's time to give them each little itty bitty piece of evidence when I could just give them the confession. It's much more efficient to tie one claim to one support. It also makes it more clear the connection because if you add a lot of support, I have to do a lot of digging to figure out like where where did that claim come from? Or if you have one support and a lot of claims, I have to try and do like a diagram, like I'm a, again, like a detective. I'm tying string and making thumbtacks everywhere. Like where do they make the connection here? It's much easier for your reader just to do one-to-one. -one. Same with the idea that you should have all the parts if you don't have evidence, your reader's going to question where your idea came from. If you don't have a claim, your reader's going to be confused about what to do. And then the rationale, if you don't have a rationale, the reader, uh, the reader loses the connection. And you take a real risk when you don't have a rationale where you could lose your reader. Or the reader can interpret it differently and then the reader loses trust in you. So it's safer to have all the parts. And then lastly, uh, it's most effective to have it in the claim support rationale order. You can change the order a bit for stylistic reasons like the element of surprise or uh, making tension. But when you don't follow this order, you risk the cognitive structure that's already laid out. If you remember from when we learned about patterns of organization, our brains like to start from something broad to something specific. Our brains like when you walk us through each step at a time. So for that reason, it makes sense to follow claim support rationale because you're starting with this broad idea, 
moving to something more specific, and then ending on the actual steps in logic. So the main takeaway from claim support rationale is that you should have one to one to one, you should have all of them, and they should probably be in that order. Let's focus on the first part, the claim. So I said a claim is a debatable idea. How is that different from an opinion? These definitions sound so similar. What I'm going to explore is that a claim is different from an opinion in the sense that a claim is academic. A claim is focused on one, it needs evidence. It's focused on gathering evidence and proving a point. A claim is also not biased. It's objective in its statement. It doesn't have biased language. An opinion, though, can be biased and can only really be grounded in personal opinion. So an example would be, coffee is the best flavor of ice cream. Come on, captions, wake up. Uh, coffee is the best flavor of ice cream. The word best there is a bit biased because who decides if something's best? That's an indication that it's pretty much based on just what I like and doesn't really have a founding. Sure, I could find arguments like about coffee ice cream sales or about like preference from uh, customers at an ice cream place, but it isn't fact yet. So to restructure that opinion into a claim, I could maybe say um, more restaurants should serve coffee flavored ice cream to meet the needs of their clients or customers. And that's more objective, actually has value, there's no biased language in it, and it's something that can be backed with evidence. Again, the example of sales and surveys. I'm going to complicate this again. I see a lot of times papers that say X is important or necessary, with X being a topic like a climate change is important or it's necessary that we address climate change. If I use the words important or necessary, am I being biased at all? Can I use evidence to support something being important? It's a gray area, but it leans towards opinion. The reason being is what we find important or necessary is based in a personal opinion. An example is, I think English classes are very important, and I would say they are necessary. I believe a lot of my students would disagree with that. They don't want to be here. So in that way, what I think is important is not what my students think is important. And if I, even if I give reasonings or my logic, it doesn't necessarily change their mind. It's more effective to reword a statement like X is important to focus on the impact or consequence. This is something understandable and objective. So if climate change, rather than say climate change is important to address, you could say climate change has possible negative impacts on our health within the next 10 years. Let's jump back to our hot dog sandwich example. Look back at your paragraph that answer that you wrote out and see, did you include a statement that is an opinion or a statement that's a claim? And if you include an opinion, can you now fix it to make it a claim? Can you get rid of any biased language in there and make sure it's grounded in evidence? For this next part, I have a video that just illustrates claim support rationales in a total paragraph, because that's what we're building to. We have claim and evidence, and now we're getting to the full argument. So for this video, I'm going to play it and I would like you to identify the claim, support, and rationale in the video. I am trying to be a good person and return it to you. Return what to who? Aren't you Patrick Star? Nope. And this is your ID? Nope. I found this ID in this wallet. And if that's the case, this must be your wallet. That makes sense to me. Then take it. It's not my wallet. Ah! What a great video. Who doesn't like SpongeBob? So again, feel free to rewatch that. I'm going to link it in the page for this week. And try and figure out the claim support and rationale here. Here's the answer I came up with. 
the claim I see is this is your wallet. It's a debatable statement. It could or cannot be the wallet. It isn't biased because it's just wallet identity or wallet, wallet ownership. The next part is the support or evidence. And that is, I found this ID in this wallet. Note that there hasn't been analysis yet. Evidence is very objective still. It's just stating what exists. An ID is in this wallet. Then comes the rationale. And I want you to note here, the language. The language really sets up to prove that the reader or the author is trying to establish logic. The video says, if that is the case, this must be your wallet. If that is the case, it must be your wallet. It explains how having an ID in a wallet proves Patrick owns the wallet. Again, we're going to jump back to our hot dog sandwich example. Look at your paragraph. What was your evidence? And where is your rationale? To again illustrate, I have my, um, my argument. So my claim is a hot dog is a sandwich. My evidence is a definition that I'm constructed. So a definition for a sandwich is a sandwich is composed of bread around a base, like a meat, che <laughs> meat, cheese, or vegetable. Sorry about that. So I have a debatable claim, bias free. My evidence is objective. It just states something that exists, a definition. And then my rationale, again, I'm using language here to tell my reader that I'm explaining. I say, since a hot dog has a bun, it has a bread around a base, meaning it must be a sandwich. This is a difficult thing. Students always struggle with rationales and it's something I struggled with for a long time. It takes practice. And the first step with that is identifying the parts. Once you get a hang of what each part is, it's easier to transition to writing. So for this activity, I've created six examples from annotated bibliographies. So things that are evaluating or synthesizing sources. And the task is to read the sentence and find the claim, support, and rationale. And for every sentence, something's missing. So you need to identify what of those parts is missing. Let's do the first one together. There is, this source is credible because its authors are from the University of Alabama. I see a claim right off the bat. This source is credible. It's a debatable statement because it could be not credible. It's bias free. I don't see anything like most credible or super perfect or anything like that. It's just objective. This source is credible. Next I see, because its authors are from the University of Alabama. I was tempted to call this a rationale because I saw the word because. Because I always associate with reasoning. Here though, because just signals evidence. Because when you look at its authors are from the University of Alabama, it's just stating something that exists. If you took it out of context, you could just say authors are from here. The authors are from that university. You have yet to say why that's credible. So in this example or this problem, I see a claim, I see support, but I am missing a rationale. If I wanted to add a rationale, I could say or explain that those who attend uh, a university typically have a PhD, which indicates they have a high level of understanding and education in that field, and they're therefore credible. So for the rest of these problems, you are free to try them out on your own and email me if you would like some answers.